love, joy, peace, the fruit of his spirit, gifts of God's own nature poured out to us, for us, within us. His love, unconditional and sacrificial. His joy, abounding, unbridled, holy. His peace, light untarnished by the darkness of uncertainty, a foundation unshaken by chaos. These gifts can only be found in and through Jesus. For Jesus is love. He is joy. He is peace. Jesus who breaks through the darkness. Jesus who gives us rest and shelter in the chaos. Jesus who defeated sin and death. Jesus alone who is worthy of our worship. We worship him because he is King of Kings, Lord of heaven and earth, Prince of peace, friend of sinners, and he is worthy of our praise.
morning, everybody out there in the seats and everybody watching online. My name is Christina Kirsch. I am the elementary creative programmer here at Kensington in Clinton Township. I have some really fun things coming up that I'm gonna tell you about today. The first thing is we are going to be having a night of worship here at CT. That's this Wednesday, yeah, it's gonna be great. That's this Wednesday, it's June 14th, and um, I don't know about you, but one of the ways I connect to Jesus is by listening to music um, and singing, and so I think it would be all great, it would be great if you guys would all come. We are inviting all the campuses, and it's free, there's no cost to you, and there's a child care from birth to pre-K, and that'll be available for you. So I hope to see you there. The next thing we have is VBS. So that's my favorite time of the year besides Christmas and Easter. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that and I wanna make sure you sign your kids up. So that's graduated kindergarten to graduated fifth grade. And we are going to make crafts, we're gonna do t-shirts, we're gonna have a scavenger hunt. We have a water day where a fire truck is gonna come and spray everybody. We got dunk takes, a giant slip and slide. We'll have a field day. And um, we're gonna have Pastor Adam teaching also with one of my teachers, Kevin, incredible. And then we're also gonna have uh, the band to come to do live worship. And our K-Kids worship team will be coming to dance too. So I wanna make sure you sign your kids up and think Think about your neighborhood kids, your grandkids, because one of my favorite parts about VBS is meeting and seeing new kids that don't usually attend Kensington. So if you could go ahead and do me a favor and sign them up so that we can plan for them to come. We also have the Mustang raffle going on. You might have noticed that we have a beautiful red Mustang out front. Um, we have Full Throttle and the Move Out teams are here today. And all the proceeds for this go to help our Move Out networks. So why don't you check out the screen and see what you can win. Sam Anderson here on behalf of Full Throttle and our Move Out Network to tell you about an incredible raffle that we have here at Kensington. Now, to do this, I had to wear my leather jacket and I had to get my Stang stash going because we're raffling off a 1972 Mustang. So this thing is absolutely gorgeous and we are raffling this thing off for only $20 a ticket. You can get one ticket for 20 bucks or you can get three tickets for 50 bucks. And basically, all of the proceeds are going to fuel our Move Out Network. Now, if you don't know what our Move Out Network is, it's a network of over, over 50 groups that are active in Metro Detroit and actually all across the state of Michigan. We have community gardens, we have the Micah 6 Project, we have our school partners. They're just being the hands and feet of Jesus to our local communities. Now, the raffle drawing is on the 19th, which means you have between now and Father's Day. So if you messed up on Mother's Day and you didn't do a great job with the gift and all that, this is an awesome opportunity for you to get some tickets for mom so that she can have this beast in the drive. Or you can get some tickets for your dad for Father's Day. Now, your dad's not going to be mad that you spent a couple bucks on this opportunity here, okay? He's not going to be like, what the heck? I wanted that ugly tie and those, uh, you know, socks with my face on them. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for this. I mean, this thing is an absolute beast. It's got Krager 15-inch wheels. And actually, the convertible part is actually automatic. You hit this little switch, and it comes back all on its own. It has a Cleveland 351, big old V8 muscle car engine in it. I mean, check out this interior. It's got this white vinyl interior. It's an automatic, so you don't have to be able to drive a manual to use it. I mean, this thing is an absolute beast. If I could pay $20, and have a chance at driving this car, I would jump all over the opportunity. So make sure you visit kensingtonchurch.org slash Mustang to get more info, more details. There's more specs on the car. Uh, there's more details about the Move Out Network and how maybe you can even jump in and serve with that. But join this raffle, man. This thing, this thing is sweet. So Sam's up there, he's giving a little Guy Fieri, a little diner drives and dives. You guys could be that too. Don't you want that? I know I do, it's way cooler than my 2001 Tracer or Tracker, I can't even remember because it's so uncool, I don't even remember the name. So um, make sure that you go out there, buy tickets, and if you're not in the room and you wanna purchase tickets, you can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash Mustang. Okay, so if you are new, or if you have any questions about all the stuff I just threw 
at you. You're gonna wanna head out to the center of our lobby and look for the hub. You'll look for the people in the orange shirts and uh, they can help point you in the right direction and they will have a little something for you if you're new as well. Uh, before we hear from Adam on our third week of Vine and Grapes, I'm gonna just ask you guys to stand on up, greet your neighbor and tell them what you would name that Mustang if you won. Well, good morning, Kensington. I'm standing here with Brian Mowry, our new senior pastor. And I just want to say, Brian, we're so super excited, the staff, the congregation, to actually welcome you here. So mm. I thought it'd be great for you to give a brief update in terms of what your plans are for the summer. Yeah, well, we're so excited. First off, just wanted to thank everybody for your prayers. I've had several people come up to me and say, you know, Brian, we're really praying for mm -hmm. you. And we're just so thankful for that. Uh, just a couple weekends ago, we found our home in Michigan, which was a huge win. Uh, the girls are so excited. They're running through the house, picking their rooms. <laughs> and uh, that's just really pulling us and drawing us here to Michigan, which is so exciting. I've been working with the staff teams and the lead pastors as we really look ahead at this upcoming year. And we have some exciting things to share in the weeks to come. But um, we're going to be coming in mid-July, moving in mid-July. And then I'll be officially starting on staff August 1st. So... Thank you so much for all your prayers, and um, we're just really excited to join you. Awesome. Yeah. You know, we're, um, it can't be soon enough for us. You know, the vote <laughs> is a while ago, and so now we're like holding our breath and waiting. But also want to let you know that my role moving forward is going to be to assist Brian in the transition. I mean, there's a big change for you, and I know Kensington pretty well over 20-some <laughs> years. Uh, and also, by virtue of the bylaws, you're going to be stepping on to the elder board, and right. of course, we're voting today on the budget and on the elders. And then I'll be stepping off, but serving as the executive director yes. under you for the next year. Yes, I'm so excited that Craig is, is staying and we've had a great partnership already and just a, a love for one another. And so thanks for that, Craig. Well, friends, you know, uh, we love you. We're so excited uh, to join you in August. And um, thank you for making this affirmation vote today for the budget and the elders. Super, super elder team. Uh, that I've loved to travel with and so excited to work with them as well. But have a wonderful day and I'll see you soon. I know we're excited to have Brian come on staff as the senior pastor over all of Kensington. It's been a minute since we've been looking for one, as some of you have been around for a while know. So we're really thrilled that him and his family will be here in August. And I know they would really love it, and we would love it if you would continue to pray for them, because transition's hard, kids in schools and houses. So just be in prayer about that as it is coming up as well. Well, now we're going to take a couple of minutes to have our annual vote. We've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks, where we are going to affirm the budget for all of Kensington as well as our elders. So on the screen in just a couple of moments, you will see a couple of opportunities that you can vote. You want to grab your cell phone, you can scan the QR code, you can use our app or go to the link up there as you see of .org slash vote. But I'm going to go ahead and walk back. We're going to take a couple of minutes to do that now. If you're here or watching in the line, make sure you vote now because it's only available to do that during the service. So we're going to go ahead and do that and then we'll come back and continue with our day.
So if you had any struggles in the voting process after the service, stop at the hub in the lobby. There's some people with iPads or they can help you with your smartphone so you will be able to vote. So we're going to continue on this series we've been in about vine and grapes. And now we're going to hear from Sam and Shauna quickly in a video about what the process looks as a vineyard is starting to be planted. And then we'll get into the text today. Hey Kensington, we're here at 3 North Vines to learn a little bit more about a vineyard and what it takes to grow grapes. And today we're gonna to talk all about the cycle of growth. And once again, we have our friend Christy with us. Welcome. Hi. Christy, can you tell us what it takes for the grape to grow? Like what happens, when does it start? What does that look like? How long does it take? What are the stages all in between? We're out here in a different vineyard than we've been talking in, in the previous ones. Um, and you'll notice you don't see a lot here. No, there's nothing. <laughs> he's, got these, he's got these little baby little, boys. There's little baby plants. Little baby we were standing in and the middle of, uh, this is the vineyard. guys down there. Actually, first week. This is Ooh. its one week birthday here. Okay. Really? Yeah. Happy birthday. So don't step on it. Yeah. Okay, so this is what it looks like at the beginning. It looks like you had a really nice field and you planted some sticks in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. So at first, it's very um, quiet here in the vineyard. It doesn't look really impressive, but in, within this first year, they're gonna grow up. The wires are getting prepped to go in right now, and um, they will make it up to that wire that we were looking at on that trellis before for by the end of the season. Oh, wow. Okay. So That's what is that, like growth. two feet, three feet? Yeah, it's good. They're gonna, they're gonna grow about three three feet okay, with it wow. by, by, by fall. By fall, wow. Wow, okay, so it goes from stick to three and a half foot stick, <laughs> then what? Then hopefully next spring, we're gonna have this like, you know, toddler, I guess you could think of yeah. it, or, you know, somebody maybe just get ready to go to kindergarten, and we're gonna be able to put them up on that trellis and start to train them to do what we want. Okay. Which, in the other vineyard, you know, you saw like more of a T-shape. This yeah. is gonna be more of an umbrella shape. It's gonna go yeah. up real high and fall down, yeah. kind of like a willow tree. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're gonna be training it into that shape for the next year to two years. And then in year three, we get really excited because we can finally let these plants make little great babies. Ooh, ooh. And we get a small okay, harvest. Okay, all right, okay. You want to think of them maybe as like mid-teens at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then yeah. they have that first harvest of fruit. So many human parallels here. <laughs> yeah. And then by year five, we're at like in our 20s, we're rolling along and we're yeah. at full maturity. Making really bad decisions. Exactly. Yeah. No, hopefully they're making good decisions at this <laughs> point. They're well-trained at that point. Oh, that's yeah, right, that's right. Well they've had they're great, out in the real world. They've had great parents, yes. like, you know, training the child up yes. in the way it should go. Is there different types of maintenance throughout the process? Like right now, it's a baby stick in the ground. So like you're not, there's, not probably not a lot of maintenance going on right then and there. Well, actually, we're a little we're very hands on at this stage, kind of like new parents. Okay. We really have to, you know, work on them and tell them what what are the do's and don'ts. Sometimes we might put out a stake if we see somebody kind of off. Love it when someone puts out a stake. For yeah, me. we got to tie, tie I'll them up. I'll do whatever up. they want me, whatever they want me to do for a stake. Yeah. So there's a lot of different work. It's for hands on in some ways. It's not as normal as we would do once they're kind of established. Okay. So, you know, we're doing different things those first three years. Chrissy, that is that is so cool. Um, I can't wait to hear what you have for us next week. Awesome. We'll see you then. Cool. Up here, we came from Plymouth and Scuttlebutt. You know, it's a small town, and the farmers were looking at. Did you say Scuttlebutt? The... Scuttlebutt. What is Scuttlebutt? That's and where you like live. Like the gossip, the town. Oh, the Scuttlebutt. Okay. <laughs> the town. The town. I know a couple Scuttlebutts at Kensington. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about you. I know a couple Scuttlebutts on this video team. <laughs> then that gets pollinated. It's all, they're self-pollinating, and then that forms self the fruit. They're self-pollinating. Yep. Ah. They're self-pollinating. Oh. So although we have beehives, well, they don't need no man. No. I'm pretty sure we are all aware of who is the biggest scuttlebutt in this whole thing. <laughs> if you were here last week, he talked about crop dusting too. So what a, I'm gonna, Sam's gonna be here next week and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to bust on him. I'm gonna give you a little ammunition. So all of you will get to use that next week. Hey, um, really interesting, the parallels between the vine and this growing process, right? Like I find it's interesting, you know, pretty early on, it's not that significant, but, but man, when, you, when it gets after it, it can grow pretty quickly. But the reality is, whether you're talking about something growing in the ground or us just growing, pursuing relationship, like life just hits in ways that sometimes wrecks you or checks you at minimum. Like 
How many people in this room, and I would ask, raise your hands, experienced some type of fear, anxiety, doubt, shame this week? For me, it was this morning. That's a little excessive. No, no, I'm just kidding. No. No, yeah, I woke up, and I was anxious. No idea why. No real thing that happened last night or over the weekend. The weekend was actually pretty good. I mean, I've got some thoughts, but woke up. I didn't sleep great, just not poorly, but up and out, you know, awake quite a few times. But I woke up, and I was just anxious. Like, it just hit. And sometimes there's really significant reasons why we're fearful, why we experience shame, doubt, why we're anxious. Because the reality is we exist in this world that is full of sin and what we call the curse of sin. And every day, sometimes it feels like every moment or a significant amount of moments in our day, we feel that reality. And it presents itself with anxiousness, with doubt, with all of these other descriptive adjectives that just come at us in such a way. And Jesus, his disciples experienced the exact same thing. So in one of his last interactions that he was with them, which we talked about two weeks ago, he wanted to spend some time and talk to them about what was going to happen because he was going away. And he wanted them to understand that they could still remain with him, which sent, seemed like a very odd thing. Like he's leaving. How if he's leaving are we going to be able to remain with him and experience the same kind of thing. But what Jesus' message to them was, if you continue to be with me, I will be with you. And if you do that, not only will you be able to move away from some of the experience of shame or doubt or guilt or fear or any other descriptive that isn't positive in some manner, but you'll able be able to walk into these things in different way where you will be able to experience this full, this abundant life. But in order to do that, you gotta be with me. In that interaction, I think it's John 15, 4, he actually looks at his disciples. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I think we hear that, and I know that I do sometimes, and I'm like, wait, 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 nothing. Like, we think we're pretty competent people, and the reality is we are. Because every single one of us, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're not even sure he exists and you're just checking this out, you literally carry the stamp of God on your person because every one of us, man, woman, child, have been made in his image, which actually gives us ability to kind of do things well. But what Jesus is saying is the way that this world presses on to us because of sin. If you want to do something of lasting value, if you want to be able to overcome and experience a life set apart from things like doubt and shame, you got to abide with me. Last week, John Pomeroy was here and he says, as we abide, what Jesus wants to do, he wants to lift us up. He wants to lift the vine because there's this old fruit in our life that he wants to prune. He wants to trim away. And the reason he wants to do that is he wants to make room for a new kind of fruit a new kind of way, a new type of descriptive adjectives that we're going to start talking about today. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and pray for our service. We're going to have the ushers come down and receive the offering, and then we will jump into the text. So would you all pray with me? Father, um, man, I really thank you for the, the thing that you taught the disciples that you later communicated to Paul in some kind of way so that he would write it down so that we would understand what it is that you want to grow in our lives. My hope and prayer for all of us is that we would see more of you because as we see more of you, as we experience you, there's a different type of thing, a different type of fruit you want to produce in us. And when we do that, world watch out because you will set us free to walk in the path that you created us to. We give this time to you and ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So our ushers are gonna come down right now. They're gonna start passing these bags. Let me first say, hey, if you're a guest or you're relatively new here, we don't want you to feel any obligation like you need to participate in this part of our message and give. I know some of you have come prepared and you will. And we wanna say thank you for those of you that do that because when you give of your resources or you use your abilities to serve our church, that's where the power of this place resides and why we are able to do some pretty incredible things, not just in our local community, but in the world because of those of you who come alongside of us. And uh, not this Saturday, but the past one, we actually had our Hope Water Run where we come together and have a fun little 5K and a short race just to try to raise money for the Pocot people in order to dig clean wells. And uh, really happy to uh, say that we were able to raise enough money to... uh, provide to drill for one well, which takes us to 13 wells in the year. And if it was just people receiving clean water, that would be enough in and of itself. But the reality is once we meet that practical need, we then have a little bit more of an ability to come in and press into them and tell them of the hope of Jesus. And I want to tell you, the people that go overseas and dig the wells and give them the message, if you are contributing, you are just as important, play just as big a significant role in the way that you give of your time and your resources. So truly, thank you from the bottom of our hearts to us because the only reason we are able to press in and help and be a part of letting people 
people experience not just clean water, but who Jesus really is, is because the greater body of community comes together and we are able to do this with each other. So thank you for what it is that you do. Because without you, it would not be possible at all. So let's get back to this idea of vine and grapes, right? Like, as I said, Jesus communicated to his disciples. There was nothing that they would be able to do of real, lasting value that was apart from him. And, and we say that, like, and it's this negative context that we give to it. But it's not meant to be like that. Like what Jesus wants us to understand is there's this goal in mind of what he genuinely wants for every single one of us. And the goal is to find freedom in a life that's been tainted by the curse of sin. You see, sin comes at us in such a way and it offers something that seems great. It seems long lasting. And actually, just in truth, there's part of sin that's fun. Like when you participate in certain activities, there is pleasure, there's happiness that comes with them. But then what they do is they promise to give you that same pleasure, that same happiness in a lasting way. But it can't. And as it camps, it starts to almost bind us or restrict us in a certain tight way. So what we keep doing is we continue in a behavior that actually brings us a little bit of happiness, a little bit of fulfillment, but all it does is takes us deeper and deeper into the prison that sin casts over us. The shadow of sin we will feel and we will continue in, and the reality is that's exactly how God wants us or God wants it, because he doesn't want us to find fulfillment in a behavior that is opposite of him. You see, and in this process of abiding, what Jesus wanted us to understand is that bondage that we feel because of participating in sin, he wants to set us free from. You see, when Jesus comes alongside, when God communicates that he wants us to remain in him, it's not because he wants something from us. This is a hard thing for us to understand, and I say this a lot because in our world, in the curse of sin, because of humans, when we experience leaders or people with power and authority over us, normally they use that power for their benefit. They use it to increase their wealth, their political power, their whatever it is, and the people on the other side kind of feel the burn of it, but Jesus' kingdom was different. In Jesus' kingdom, when he comes and he starts talking about abiding in me, it's not because he wants something from us. It's because there's something he wanted to lead us into, and that's freedom. Freedom that can be found outside of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, and the way he says to them, the way that happens is you abide in me. I will lift you up, and I will start to trim some of the things off of you in order to give you a different kind of life. Paul says it like this in a letter he wrote to a church in Galatia. For those of you who don't know who Paul is, he's probably the most influential follower of Jesus ever to live. He wrote a significant portion of the New Testament, and in it, this is a verse he wrote to a letter uh, to people to talk to them about this topic. And this is what Paul says. He says, if you follow Jesus, he has set you free. He has truly set you free from the sin and the bondage that you experience. But check out this next part. He says, make sure you stay free. And don't get tied up again into the slavery and law. You see, what Paul understood, I think better than anybody, because he lived his life on such polar opposite ends of the spectrum. He was an enemy of Jesus who killed his followers, and then he became the most influential follower of his ever to live. So Paul knew what could happen between the two ends. And he wanted people to experience it. But he also understood, as they did, it's not really difficult for us to tiptoe back into that life. And what Paul's saying is once you've been cast off, once the bonds have been broken, don't go back. Don't go back to living in that kind of behavior because there is something so much better for you. And I think we could kind of interpret that verse in this way. You see, in abiding, in God's desire for us to abide in Jesus and being pruned, it's actually about our freedom. It's not about our harm. God's goal in us abiding in Jesus and being pruned is about our freedom. It's not about harm. He is a God that loves us in such a way that when he admonishes us, when he challenges us, when he communicates things to us, it's because he sees what has happened because of the curse of this world. And that's we have been shackled. 
We have been shackled looking to things to bring real joy, real value, real fulfillment, real peace that never had an ability or were intended to do that. And he doesn't want us existing in that dynamic. So he says, come to me. Come to me and abide in me and I will show you how to live this life differently. Paul goes on in that letter to write a bit about the kind of fruit he wants us to move away from. I want to read this. This is what Paul says. Paul says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, which, listen, we all have. I have one. You have one. It doesn't matter how long you follow Jesus. You will forever be at war in this world with your flesh, which is constantly after you, pursuing you to step outside of what it is that Paul is going to talk about here. So when we find that, when you follow the desires of that sinful nature, the results are this. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Listen to me. I think we can read that list and we think, man, Paul's jumping all over us for the ways that we mess up. That's not at all what I think he's doing here. But what he's sharing with us is every single one of us, myself included, has a natural bend because of our flesh and the curse of this world. And that's to participate in all of those things and others that he has said. Those are the activities. Those are the things that bring bondage that Paul, that Jesus are saying, I want to pull you out of. I want to set you free. And what Paul's not saying is, if you have decided to follow Jesus and you ever do one of these actions again, you're actually not a genuine follower. That's not at all what Paul is saying. The reality of this world is, as we decide to pursue a relationship with Jesus, he is going to teach us and help us move out of those behaviors. It's a lot like that little vine, right? You get planted and you start small. But as you learn, as you grow, you get stronger. And the things that used to pull at you The things that pull at me don't quite have the same grip. There'll be moments where you struggle. There'll be moments where you go back into a behavior that you thought you had kind of moved out of. But God's invitation is come back to me. Abide in me because what is now clamping down on you, what's handcuffing you to take you back into bondage, I want to remove from you. I want you to be with me and abide in me. He goes on in verse 21 to set this. Let me tell you again, as I had had before, that anyone living in that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, he's not saying your sin excludes you. This is the reality of the gospel. Following Jesus plus nothing earns you salvation. It's not your good works. It's not that you don't sin anymore. It's not that you check those boxes of that wonderful list that actually makes us a Christian. It's actually committing to following Jesus. I heard a pastor say it like this one time, and I love it. He says, becoming a follower of Jesus doesn't mean we're sinless, but it does mean in some capacity we will begin to sin less and less. Will we ever reach that? No, I've not reached it. Nobody, no pastor, no theologian, Paul himself, nobody ever came to the place where they didn't live in sin. But what he is saying is as we abide in Jesus, this will start to change in our life. Jesus' brother James said it like this. He says, as you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. And as he draws close, as he begins to influence us, as we rub shoulders with him the way he is, his actions start to rub off on us and we begin to become more like him, which means he's lifting us up and he's pruning away that bad fruit. He's starting to cut it away and the reason that he's cutting it away is because he wants to make room for something new, something better, something that doesn't bind us but actually brings us freedom. And Paul goes on to describe adjectives of the fruit that Jesus wants to bring in our lives. This is what he says. He says, the fruit of the Spirit are these, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And what Paul does in this moment is list the nine things that a person who abides with Jesus will start to see being produced in their life. As they are being with him and he lifts us up and he cuts away the old, making room for the new, he is starting to demonstrate or showing us what it is that we will be a part of. And today, we're going to focus on the first three for the last bit of this time. We're going to talk about love, joy, and peace that can all come in the middle of circumstances that would dictate that those should not be the adjectives that would describe our life. 
The first one is love. Now, we all do this. We say the word love, and we can mean a variety of different things, right? Like, now this is where I want you to get Sam Anderson. Is everybody with me? I need a yes or an amen. Everybody with me? Okay, good. Sam Anderson has a tattoo of a slice of pizza on his arm, I believe. And Sam Anderson says he loves pizza, which is fine. Do you know what Sam Anderson doesn't have a tattoo of? His wife or children. So, that's right. Sam, if you're watching this, yeah, that's what you get for giving everybody my email. No, but that's, see, we use love in a bunch of different ways. We love pizza, and we say the same word as we would say that I love my wife or I love my kids or whatever it is, but in the Greek, there's actually four different words that describe love, and they differentiate out between each one the type of love that we're talking about, and the type of love that Paul is talking about that Jesus had for everybody was called agape love. This isn't a love about your favorite type of food, your favorite type of pizza, fried chicken, whatever it is. Sorry, I'm a foodie. You can see where I go in this. But it's a deeper love. It's a love that is more concerned with somebody else than it is its own intentions and its own things. The word agape love is actually an ancient word that was used to connect the idea of a preference. right? And it's not the preference of what I want. Like, not the preference, but yes, that I would like this, so I need you to do something for me. It's actually the opposite. The agape love that he is talking about is when we prefer somebody else over ourselves. And when we do that, the way that we interact or treat them results in a different kind of action. I'm more concerned about their benefit, their well-being than my own. It's not always all about me. It's actually about somebody else in this type of dynamic. And the great thing is not only did Jesus talk about this, not only did he enlighten Paul about it to share with us, this is something that he demonstrated throughout his whole earthly ministry that actually climaxes in when he goes to the cross. Paul wrote another letter describing the way Jesus agape loved us. And this is what he says. He says, for our sake, me, you, all of humanity, for our sake, Jesus became sin when he knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. There's a translation of the Bible called The Message written by a man named Eugene Peterson. And I love the way he describes this. This is what he says. He said, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be right with God. That's agape love. Do you want to know why Jesus was so effective in his ministry and then so were the disciples and then so were Paul? It's because they practiced this. Jesus in his life and everything he did was worrying about the preference of somebody else rather than the preference of his own. When he interacted with people, when he let himself be interrupted by the crowd, when he was mourning the loss of his cousin, he actually comes back to be with people that are searching, that need him. And he didn't do that because he wanted something from them. Remember, God doesn't need anything from us. Actually, no, the reason he did that is because he prefers your benefit and my benefit more than he did for his own in that moment. That is the whole message of Christmas through Easter. It's Jesus loved us so much that he left heaven and the glory and wonder and splendor and true joy filled with peace that would offer and came and existed in a sin-cursed world where he would suffer. The reason that he did that is because he preferred us over his own moments of situations and circumstances. And when the disciples learned this and modeled it, it changed them. It changed the people that were around them. And then by and stance, 2,000 years later, we are sitting, talking about, still studying the words that Jesus laid out because there's something inside of us that knows this is right. We know this is good. And even if we're like struggling with preferring others, we know that that's what we would want. And when we can talk about ourselves in the best state, this is what we're doing for others. And the reason that is is because I believe inside of each and every one of our hearts, God has set this in. And what he wants to do is for us to abide in him because as we do, he will start to fan that flame. He will start to create in you, in me, something that burns, that he wants to set free on us to unleash on this world in the best kind of way. And that is loving in an agape manner where we prefer others over ourselves. Agape love is the crown jewel of the fruits of the Spirit. And when we start to get this one, 
all of the other things start to flow in its place. Let's talk about the second one, joy. Joy is that thing that we all long for. Joy isn't happiness. Happiness is a thing that comes and goes. It's more momentary. We feel it based on the situation that we are in. That's happiness. Joy is something different. Biblical joy that Jesus came to bring us to help that when we abide in that he wants to deliver us isn't contingent on that type of thing. You see, joy is this. It's an attitude that God's people adopt, not because of happy, happy circumstances, but because of our hope in God's love and promise. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking, because sometimes I have this thought too, and I'm supposed to preach and be a pastor for a living. That's not the type of joy I had in mind. See, the joy for a lot of us we have in mind is more based on us being happy in the circumstance that we find ourselves in. But let me share why I think if we could refocus this, man, it could change the way that we operate in this. And the reason that would be is, again, it modeled what Jesus did. And you see that as people begin to change, as they begin to abide, as this type of fruit begins to grow in their life, the circumstances, be they hard, actually don't dictate the way that we respond. They don't dictate the way that we react to something. And this is what Jesus modeled in such a way. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, we can do what it is described next. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. Leave this up for a second. I know this is incredibly obvious to say. Jesus did not experience happiness, joy when he was getting ready to go to the cross. We know that after this moment where he interacts with his disciples and he goes, he prays, and the text tells us that he sweat blood, which is a medical condition that talks about the intensity and the ferocity of the stress that he was under. The different thing about him is he knew what was coming. He knew that soldiers were gonna peel his robe off. They were gonna put a crown of thorns on his head. They were gonna take a whip and lashing it out into different pieces of strips with sharp bone and rock and they were going to flog him with it over and over until probably his ribs and some of his internal organs were exposed. Like that is not the type of thing that any of us look at and see joy, but what Jesus knew is what was coming. It doesn't say in the moment, it says for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Do you know what the joy before him was? It's every single one of us. Every single person that would understand what he did for us, that was the joy he was looking toward. It wasn't found in the moment that he found himself in. And I think what we can understand and apply to our life is this. Our joy that is described in this, that we are understanding, is not in what's coming. Our joy is not found in where we are currently are. Excuse me, it is found in what is coming. Our joy is found in where we will be, what is coming, not where we currently are. And that's hard to say, easy to say, excuse me, hard to understand, hard to apply, hard to live out in our life. And does that mean there won't be moments where we get this wrong and we mess up or the situation grabs onto us in a way that we don't respond the way we should? No, it doesn't. A couple of years ago, my family was in a bit of a transition as I was going to school while I was pastoring. And because of the way I wasn't working as much, we decided to uh, live with a family member, which meant all of our things were in the basement. And some of you know this story. I got a call that there was a flood and every single piece of anything that I owned, except for a handful of clothing that I had with me, was in that basement. My wife and my kids, and I'm telling you, when I got back and I looked at the water and all of my things sitting in it, joy was not what I felt in that moment. I had something in my hands, and there might have been a word that came out of my mouth that I probably shouldn't repeat, and something that got shattered on the wall. But what Jesus promises is what he tells us is when you find yourself in whatever your circumstance is that's like mine, he's going to start to lean in and press it in such a way so that initial reaction, that initial response that was mine, doesn't become the default. I can't tell you how it happened, but I know that is in that weekend, extended, that was probably the longest, most exhausting physically and mentally, he started to come close to me. Because of the process of abiding, he drew in near and he started to change my thinking. And he wasn't changing my thinking because my life was getting happy in the moment. It was because in the most difficult or the types of circumstances that are hard, he will press in in such a way and do something that we can't do on our own. That's what he means when he said, you can't do this apart from me. 
You can't feel like this when circumstances like that happen, but when we abide and we allow him to hack away that bad fruit, he will start to replace it with something new. He'll start to replace it with love and joy that isn't based on exactly us feeling good about what's happening. He will make it contingent on the joy that's set before us because we're gonna be there in a day where all of that melts away in the best kind of way. But until then, he came to bring us freedom from not just sin, but the way that life hits to lead us into something different, into something better. Tim Mackey, who's a... uh, founder of um, a Bible project says it like this. He says, when you believe that Jesus's love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable even in the darkest of circumstances. When you believe that Jesus's love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. If you're sitting there and you're saying there's no way, I'm going to tell you that's okay. Because you won't get there on your own. I can't get there on our own. None of us can. But what Jesus says, as you come close to me, you spend time with me, I will start to produce fruit in your life that looks like this. When he says he wants to bring us freedom, this is what he's talking about. It's freedom that's not based on what's happening around us, but freedom that only he can offer. I have to go fast, so I'm going to talk quickly. I apologize in advance. The third one is peace. See, in the Bible, when they talk about peace, it's this idea of a sense of wholeness, right? When something is correct, when all of the necessary pieces are together, what I would say, it's kind of like the proverbial puzzle that we would like our life to be. And in our proverbial puzzle, we want all of the pieces to fit together. We want everything to happen in the way that we think it should. We want it all to be delivered in such a manner that we can have happy joy. And what Jesus is saying is as you come close to me, Paul is communicating, as you abide in me, I'm going to start to give you a peace and a joy that transcends the circumstances. That season was a difficult one for me because I'm a planner and there's part of me that's a provider and going to school and paying for that while not working enough to really provide for my family was a bit of a struggle. It made me feel insignificant as a man, and I wondered, like, am I making the right decision, even though I was, because that's the flesh pulling at me, right? Saying, this doesn't make sense, but that's the reality. Following Jesus, it's not going to make sense. Another part of his word, he says, the wisdom of this world will look different. The way that you operate will look foolish to it. If I went and talked to most people and said, I'm going to quit my job to go to school to do this, and we're going to live here, and it's going to financially hurt, they'd be like, you're an idiot. And you know what? In some contexts, they're right. Except for when it's connected to abiding and following Jesus. He wants to bring us to a place where our circumstances don't determine our joy. They don't determine our peace. Our relationship with him does that. And when we find that, And we can start to walk out into that. There's a freedom that he wants to give us. He wants to release us from the bondage that sin holds over our lives. Listen, life is hard. And it's complex. And he gets that. We exist in this strange dynamic. Jesus has come. And he's brought the kingdom of heaven with him. But we don't get it in its fullness. There's still sin in the taint. So what he said is I have created a way where that weird dynamic of both realms existing of evil and heaven, I will give you what you need to experience that in the way the Bible describes as an abundant life. And the way we find that isn't by following the rules. It's not by attending church every week religiously. It's not about reading through the Bible in a year, every year. Those are good things. But when we look to those as the means, we get it twisted and it creates kind of a toxic relationship with us and God. What God is saying is that stuff is important and it will come. But what I want you to do is be with me. I want you to abide with me. I don't want you to get caught up in religion. I want you to have a relationship with me. You see, sometimes we hear religion, relationship, and we think the difference is semantical. It's not. If we get that right and understand that he wants relationship with us so he can lift us up and cut away the bad in order to make room for the good, 
we will start to experience life in the way that Paul is talking about. Not just with these first three, but with the other six that we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks as well. Jesus sees our heart, he sees our troubles, he sees our worries, but what he told his disciples in that moment is I'm gonna give you something. Yes, I'm going away, but I'm gonna send something that's better and it was a truth that was available to them and is available to every single one of us and what's amazing is what it wants to bring. This is what Jesus says, he says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit who the Father will send in my name will teach you all things He will remind you of everything I have said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Remember when Jesus was going to the cross in that troubling moment. He was looking for the joy that was coming before him. Which made that circumstance far different for him. And what he's saying to his disciples and to all of us is what he had He wants to give to us. He wants to move us in a place in the way that we do that as we abide with him. And as we abide, is he gonna shift our thinking? Yeah. There's some things that you and I participate on. He's gonna say, guys, this is wrong. We don't get to be the the arbiter of morality. We can't do that because yours is different than mine and mine's different than yours. And, And then who's genuine? When we hurt others and they hurt us, it's like, well, who's the authority? We can't be the moral police. And it's not about Jesus being moral police. It's about him saying, I know what will bring you freedom. I want to set you loose into that in the best kind of way. Jesus told them he was going away, but he would send the spirit that would teach them and teach us. So that we can understand how to live in this sin-cursed life and experience what Jesus experienced even when he was going to cross. And the way that you find that is by abiding. How many of you have uh, kids or maybe yourself as a kid, you kind of have nightmares and so you'd run down to mom or dad or grandma or whoever to make you feel better, yeah? Little hands, big hands. How about big hands? There we go. It happens to my daughter. It happens to some of my kids, but more frequently, one of my girls. But this is what my daughter knows. She's on the second story. I'm on the first story. But when she's scared, her dad's in the house. And she is allowed to rush into my presence at any moment and tell me why she is scared. And her father will be there to help her and to comfort her. And let me tell you, I am a bad example of the way that God wants to do this for us. If you are fearful, if you are anxious, if you are scared, if life is hitting in such a way that it brings you down, know this, your father is in the house. Your father wants you to come to him so that he can help to show you how to experience joy and peace even when life would dictate that you have no business existing in those adjectives. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me. And the way that we find these is by abiding in him. And as we abide and he lifts us up and he prunes, he will teach us how we can experience these. So this is my challenge for you. This week, what are the things or what is one thing that God wants to lift up the vine to cut out of your life? What's something that you've been participating in? And listen, this is me not shaming you. Like I've got my own list I could take you through. But what I came to understand is God wants to lift you up because he wants to cut that away because there's something better. There is something better that doesn't bind you but brings freedom that he wants to offer in your life. And if you are open to spending time with him, to finding relationship with him, and not just checking off the boxes and being a good Christian, He wants to take you on a journey much like that piece of stick that grows into a bullvine where we are growing, we are developed, we are learning how to have love, joy, and peace and the other six that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. But we have to be willing to go on the journey with him. Are you willing? This week, my charge to you, spend time with him, listen, read some. Talk to him and listen and see what it is that he says because he wants to move us into something else. I'm gonna close with this last thought. Paul said this. He says, we may have sorrow. 
In this life, I think we know that. Anybody sorrow ever experienced it? It's in the cards. Listen, if it hasn't hit you hard, I'm just telling you, there's a day that it's coming where it is gonna hit, but this is the way God wants us to operate. And as we abide, we may have sorrow, yet we rejoice. The reason Paul was able to write that is he spent time with Jesus. He developed that relationship. He abided and got lifted up and the old stuff got cut away. New things began to grow so that he could walk in a freedom that Jesus experienced that he wants us to have for ourselves. And if we do that, not only is your life gonna change, your boss, your kids, your employees, your brother and sisters, the difficult relationships, those are gonna start to change. You can't live this out and not experience something different because that is what Jesus promises, that's what he teaches, that's what he wants for every single one of us. But what we have to do to experience this is abide. The only part we have to play is put in the effort and pursue him. And if we do that, watch out world, because not only will he change you, you'll start to change the people around you, and there will be something different than you ever thought or imagined could be possible. Let's pray. I thank you for what you promised, Lord. I thank you for the truth of your word pray that every single one of us would spend some time this week listening to you and experiencing what Jesus understood, what he taught his disciples, what Paul learned, and now that it's been put on paper so that we could have it as well. Teach us this, show us, and may we all put in the time and the effort to see if what this is is actually true, because I believe you will come through in such a way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together in worship, making this our prayer that he's all we need.
whether you're somebody who's been following Jesus for decades, just barely getting to know him, or somebody that's not even sure he exists, know this. His invitation to us is that he is always knocking at the door. The gospel tells us that he is knocking at the door and anybody that opens it, he will come and he will bring us something. It is a lot about what we just sang or described today. If we abide in him, he will bring us love, joy, peace, and six more adjectives that will describe a way that we can exist in a sin-cursed world that still has pieces of heaven mixed into it in a different way that the world cannot explain but will notice until the day that he comes and makes all this right. And his invitation to every single one of us is I want you to exist in that element. I want to teach you so that you can look for the joy set before you just like I did. I hope that you will take some time this week and on your own, crack open your Bible, talk to him and listen to him to see what more he has to say to you specifically about this subject. If you would like somebody to pray for you, our prayer team is down in front. I would encourage you to come down and let them pray for you. If not, we want to also encourage you to uh, check out the Mustang raffle. Come be with us on Night of Worship Wednesday. Something happens when we sing and we worship where that abiding process can swell and we can start to walk into a lot of what we've talked about today. Until we see you next week, have a fantastic Sunday and we look forward to next week where you come back and we talk about the next three of these fruits of the Spirit. Have a good week, everybody.